Do you love spy books, movies, and TV? Then the Spybrary podcast is for you. Since 2017, host Shane Whaley and Spybrary field agents around the world dispatch reviews and interviews with authors, historians, and fellow spy fans. We discuss everything from John le Carre, Len Dayton, Paul Vidic, Graham Greene, Nick Heron, Charles Cumming, Ben McIntyre, and many more. Spybrary is available on all good podcast apps and at spybrary.com. And welcome to episode 209 of the Spybree podcast. Today we bring you another Dead Drop 5. We're going to send another Spybrarian behind the Iron Curtain. And this is the conversation with his handler. He's going to suggest five books that he wants stashed in a Dead Drop in East Berlin. Today, we're, this is a little bit different. We welcome Matthew Dewhurst Grice to Spybree. Welcome, Matthew. Hello. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, I have to say this. If I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and I could phone a friend and it was a James Bond-related question, you would be getting that phone call. You are one of the (laughs) most knowledgeable Bondologists that I have met. And I'm very grateful to the internet for all its ills. When I was a kid and obsessed with James Bond, you know, most of my mates, they liked it at Christmas, but they weren't really into it. But when I come on to Facebook and all the online communities and especially the Hildebrand community and, you know, it really renews an interest in Bond and the movies and the books and everything associated with it. So I'm very grateful that we've got to connect online and I'm able to read your posts and see the wonderful photos of the various 007 uh, aspects of your James Bond collection. So uh, today we're going to dig into the five favorite Ian Fleming, well, actually, I shouldn't presume, the five James Bond books. I asked Matthew, I said, come on, Dead Drop 5, let's make it a 007 novel special. So uh, so welcome once again to Spybury. Before we get into your picks, how did you first come across the books? Walk us through that moment when you picked up your first 007 novel. Uh, well, it, it, it was actually, uh, I sort of got introduced to the films first, mm-hmm. um, and then I think I must have about 12 or 13, and my mother would just pick up uh, old paperback uh, books at car boot sales, which sadly is something you don't really come across now so much. Um, and then I kind of realised that, you know, the films that I kind of had watched were sort of based on these uh, on these books. And it's kind of very interesting because I can always remember reading Dr. No and... I could never really fully get into it because it was so close to the film. All I could see in my head was Sean Connery and Ursula Andress, and that kind of sort of distracted me from what Fleming had kind of written because it was so faithful. Um, So, yeah, it it, it basically sort of saw the films first and then uh, kind of saw the, uh, well, kind of read the books after um, I mean, it was about a good 15, if not more, years ago when I was uh, free and single and had plenty of time on my hands. I managed to read all the Flemings and all the continuation novels one after the other. Um, it's definitely something I won't be able to do now, but it took me a good two years. Yeah. Um, and it was just a, a really, really kind of interesting experience because A Majesty's Secret Service, the film, I never really thought much of because I, I, I it, it, it just always seemed to be the odd one out because continuity wise it never sat mm. comfortably within the films but after reading the book I actually loved the film because it was so faithful you know I realized how faithful uh, that book was uh, well how, you know how faithful the film was um so yeah it, it, it's just been um yeah, it's quite an experience and it's kind of interesting to sort of discover how some of the books are totally different to the films. Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, You Only Live Twice, Spy Love Me, Man with a Golden Gun. They're, they're just totally, you know, different from the films. Um, but there's also, you know, some good, good sort of continuation uh, novels out there as well, which which, yeah, it's some are a bit hit and miss, but 
it, 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 it's just overall quite an incredible thing, really, that well, this year we're celebrating 70 years since the publication of Casino Royale and that Fleming's work is still being celebrated and that beer, you know, having, I mean, Charlie Hickson has just released his new novel on His Majesty's Secret Service. So it is quite somewhat an achievement that Fleming's work is still being celebrated and the literature James Bond is still sort of being printed, you yeah. know, and obviously attached to the James Bond phenomenon is the multi-billion dollar film franchise as well. It was interesting. Um, another Bondologist that I hugely respect is uh, Mark Ashby, and, and he was talking about yes. the Bond books recently. And I, I shared with him that the first Bond book I read or picked up, I nagged my mother for it. It was all of 10 pence at a jumble sale. That's a flea market to our US listeners. And it was Spy Who Loved Me. Can you imagine like an 11 or 12 year old pick up Spy Who Loved Me thinking like the opening chapter is going to be the Union Jack parachute scene. And, you know, as we all know, it's 100 pages before Bond even. So I remember throwing the thing in disgust. And like that was my, f and of course, you know, I've gone back to them since and enjoy them. But that was my first go at a, a 007 novel. So it wasn't a Christopher Wood novelization no. that you picked up. No, it no, was not. Oh, no. Yeah, it was. I wish it was. Uh, it was not. So uh, anyway, mm. what's your first pick? So you're being sent behind enemy lines. You, you're going to take your five Bond novels with you. What's the first pick, Matthew? Well, the first pick, and I think it's a must, and it's got to be on everybody's, well, any Bond fans list, and it is Casino Royale. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, th th this is what kicked it off you know this is now celebrating its 70 years yeah. this year um and this is the novel which fleming had sort of introduced james bond and it's kind of as if fleming had kind of got the works of uh joseph conrad john buke and, and sort of eric ambler and kind of injected sort of color into it you know because he's kind of turned the spy genre around and it's just you know, made it that a little bit more somewhat kind of different to what had gone before. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Casino Royale, it, it's, uh, and, and, and I mean, yeah, it, it's a fantastic read, very short, um, but also it's got a great, a great heroine in the likes of Vesper Lind, which is one of, well, the first, you know, sort of Fleming female character and one of many because, I think Fleming um, had given us some fantastic female characters. I mean, they were all very well written and very strong, you know, strong minded. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think for any James Bond fan, Casino Royale's got to be up there. Um, I mean, especially with the 2006 film, that's only sort of emphasized how brilliant that book is. Um, but also, it, it, it kind of makes me think whether or not Fleming was the first uh, person to sort of invent product placement because he, you know, mentions that Bond wears a Rolex. He uh, dresses uh, from Savile Rose. Uh, he um, drives a Bentley blower. Um, he, uh, you know, has an alcoholic beverage which contains a Gordon's gin and a Kina Lillet. <laughs> so Fleming's very... Um, uh, are very good at describing things and he's certainly you know it's kind of created james bond as a very well dressed and uh gentleman with a very expensive taste um but yeah i i, I think overall casino royale would be uh my first pick um because if it wasn't really for Ian Fleming to write James Bond, then I want to be here talking to you. And I don't, and I think there'd be a huge chunk of the uh, spybery uh, sort of population kind of gone and the uh, you know, sort of titles, uh, you know, cause James Bond is obviously a, a huge sort of contributor to the spy genre. Huge. Um, huge. How does Vesper Lynn stack up to other female characters in, in the, in the Fleming novels? Um, I think she's definitely up there. Um, I mean, it, it's it's kind of an interesting one, really, because people often, you know, kind of say that Fleming is sexist, uh, sexist and all this and that. I think, well, he isn't really because, it, it, yeah, I mean, he was a womanizer and he enjoyed 
you know, women. Um, but he, all of his females were were very strong, well written characters, and. I mean, obviously, for 1953, it is a little bit dated. I mean, there's a passage in there where um, Bond kind of grumbles because M's sent a woman, and, you know, well, why has he sent a woman? All she's going to do is hang on my gun arm and she'll be a tame mine of the pots and pans. And unfortunately, that was the attitude back then. But Vesper kind of proved Bond wrong because she actually become a resourceful sort of ally. Um, she kind of then obviously betrayed him and then killed herself, which takes, you know, I mean, killing yourself takes a lot of a lot of nerves. So I think she's probably definitely up there with, coincidentally, with uh, Tracy, actually, mm. um, because they're both, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, they both sadly died, but they were both very strong women and they kind of had their own sort of, uh, well, sort of dark secrets, if you like. You know, I mean, I, mean, I think Tracy... Uh, well, today would have been diagnosed with depression or PTSD or or, or, or something. But uh, obviously, back in when the Majesty's Secret Service was written, you know, some a, a condition like that probably wasn't giving a name. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, she had strong mental mental issues because she was suicidal. Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely um, Vesper. I, I think you know she's definitely up there and. Whether or not other sort of fans and readers would probably compare the Bond girls that followed, you know, gauge them against Vesper, I don't know. But I, yeah, I certainly think Vesper Lind is definitely up there as one of the strong, strong characters. And of course, I mean, overall, she she changed Bond's mentality because mm. Bond fell in love with her and she killed herself, and that sort of gave. Bond more of a motive to sort of carry on and to and to sort of get the hand that had the whip, if you like, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think Vesper's definitely definitely up there. So big spoiler released there by Matthew, but this book has been out for seventy years. So if you haven't read it by now, oh sorry, yeah, no, no, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll watch that yeah. on the next few. But I, I'm I'm hoping that folks would have actually, you know um read read this one by now at least so uh what would your what would your second pick be matthew second pick uh well this is probably where it gets interesting so this is <laughs> the spy who loved me mm. now um i know you was disappointed because it didn't open up with the union jack but at 12 years what, old i must say <laughs> but, uh, yes um i mean w- what i like about this is purely because it's different. Yeah. Um, it was an experimental piece that Fleming had written, um, and Fleming was actually ashamed and embarrassed about it, that he wanted it to be withdrawn from publication. Um, so, he, yeah, I mean, but what makes it different is that he had um, kind of wrote it from a different, well, from a woman's perspective, from a first-person view, and, and sort of like that of From Which You Would Love, Bond doesn't actually appear uh, until sort of halfway through the book. Mm. Um, but again, I, I, I think this is a fine example of how great Fleming was as a writer because he was able to sort of experiment and then sort of go, um, you know, basically writing from a woman's point of view, where, again, I mean, Vivian Mitchell, um, she probably isn't quite up there with Vesper in, and if not, probably forgotten because she's never actually appeared in the films. But still, I mean, she's still a good character. I mean, I mean, she's been been through a, a you know been through a lot, and she's about to uh, sort of get uh, potentially murdered by two hoodlums who have uh, sort of broken into the motel that she was looking after uh, before Bond uh, kind of turns up. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of this is probably why I sort of love the folio societies because um, as I mentioned, I mean, the spy loved me isn't the film is nothing like the book. And, and that was down to the stipulation that Fleming had with Colby and Harry when they sold the film rights is that you can only use a title, but nothing else. And um, why do you think he said Craig that? Matthew? Why did he, What's that, sorry? Why, why did he insist on that? Um, because F- Fleming just didn't like the book mm. at all. He was ashamed and he was just embarrassed by it. Um, even so that he wanted it 
to be withdrawn from publication, but they kind of said no, you know, they, they kind of went along with it. Um, but yeah, it's so whether or not we will ever see a faithful adaptation of of the spiral of me, I don't know. But I think Faye Dalton's illustrations in the Folio Society kind of expand that because she's given some wonderful illustrations of things that us fans can't exactly relate to because we've never seen the visuals on film, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, also, I, I, I've, I've, I've kind of said many times whether or not Fleming um, was inspired by the film Psycho to write the spy lovely because it's obviously still got that motel setting. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the spy loved me. I, that'll be my second pick um, because it's just different. Yeah. It, it it's, it's, it's different and just hats off to Fleming for for doing something different, but it's a shame he, he kind of felt like it was a mistake, you know. Yeah, and much of the locations of that actually were yeah. set probably about an hour away from where I live. So Lake George is oh, about wow. an hour away, and, and I've driven around some of these towns. That, so it's quite funny for me because Fleming talks about Glens Falls, and it's kind of like a den of iniquity. Mm -hmm. It's where the gangsters are and, you know, ladies of the night and so forth. But you go there now, and it's just full of department-like malls. <laughs> oh, okay. Glens so, Falls. Yeah, and I'm looking it's... around thinking like, this isn't like the Dead of Iniquity that I read in, in that book, but it is a beautiful part of the world. And of course, um, Fleming came to Vermont and he came to upstate New York because his friend Ivor Bryce had a had a farm in Vermont. So that's how mm. Fleming became, um, you know, he liked to holiday here and stay at the farm and go. And it is a beautiful part of the world. So it, it's it's a lot of fun for me when I drive through that and imagining the heroine. She, 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 didn't she drive on her her Lambretta or something all the way from Montreal to Lake George. That was yes. the journey, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Which would be a beautiful I mean, way to, it's, to be fair, I mean, these books, I mean, it's been a long time since I've read them, Yes, but I'm just sort of selecting them from memory. Um, purely because I like them, but yeah. purely because I feel they do have a significant sort of meaning in them. So, yeah, I mean, I hope that my picks do kind of encourage other readers to to sort of, you know, read them, really. <laughs> yeah, and I would I would love to hear from some of our listeners, especially our female listeners that, that read The Spiral of Me. You know, how did it come across to you? And, you know, do come on to our online community at uh, spybreed.com forward slash community and come share with us how, how it, I'm always keen to know how females mm. see that one. Because, as you say, the first hundred pages are pretty much written from her perspective, right? So... They are. Um, I mean, there is a very, very controversial line in there which Fleming wrote uh, claiming that secretly women would like to be raped. Um, but, yeah, uh, but that, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm sure, you know, that, you know, but what you've got to understand is that, you know, when when people sort of, I mean, even like if you get a young audience, you know, if they read these, they've got to understand that these are a product of the time. And, you know, if they're going to be offended by it, fair enough. But, you know, <laughs> well, fortunately, um, you know, and thankfully, attitudes um, has changed and society has changed. But, you know, if you are, you know, if young people are to read, read I mean, not just Fleming, but any books from, you know, from the 50s, yeah. 60s or even earlier you know you've just got to bear in mind it was a product of its time and it's kind of almost like a time capsule because it is sort of history and thankfully we have learned from history you know and 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 you know history you can't change but you can only learn from it so i mean a couple of years ago i read uh, i think one of the first bulldog drumming books uh, written in the 1920s and um it, it, it was just amusing because the language kind of you know how they spoke and uh, i think having liver and bacon for for breakfast or something it's uh, you know it, it, but it, it, it's, it's kind of almost like a time capsule because it gives you an insight into what life was like you know back then and it's the same with the Fleming books you know it it, it it's just you know sort of going back in time yeah. so they are really interesting just for that perspective as well 
And that's one of the reasons why on our James Bond book club episodes, we record as if we're in year of publication, yes. because otherwise you do spend half the episode talking about the, uh, the language used or the terminology used and was Fleming a racist? And it's like, I don't really want to get into that. I'll leave that to others. No. And let's talk about the book as if we're in year. And some people might say it's a cop out and that's fair enough. I just don't want to spend 25, 30 minutes talking no. about it for every book, to be honest. No. But to be honest, I mean, from my point, you know, Fleming wasn't sexist and he wasn't racist, you know. <laughs> you know, he was just, you know, going with the times. And yeah. I think there's a lot of evidence out there which suggests that he wasn't because, you know, he lived in Jamaica. Yeah. He, you know, loved traveling. He, yeah. he loved traveling. He loved experiencing different cultures, tasting foods and everything. So, yeah, I think he was, you know, far from you know, a racist or a sexist, yeah. you know, because he loved women, you know, it's, he, he loved did. travel, he loved women. <laughs> It's interesting. Uh, we've got a used bookshop near here and uh, in the middle of nowhere, they have a quarter of a million books. And I was in there a couple of weeks ago and, and they know I do the podcast and stuff and we're having a chat. And the guy said to me, he said, what's going on with Ian Fleming at the moment? I said, why? He goes, the amount of people that are stopping in you asking if we've got any of the old Ian Fleming books. And I was like, yeah, because they're bringing new ones out that have been sensitized. So I think people are reading it and then they go about that in the news thinking, God, I must get the old copies before the next So I said, you want to stick the price up on those? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I have noticed uh, a, a couple of people just all of a sudden selling all the old Bond edition sinking and they might make money. But from what I gather, I think only a few of the titles have sort of been censored. Right. I don't think all of them have been censored. Yeah, yeah. I think a few. And I think they uh, do have um, a, like a well, written warning, I suppose, on the front page right. just to let yeah. you know what's happened. But no, I mean, yeah, again, that's the media just blowing things out of proportion, you know. Um <laughs> Got it. Well, I still haven't found the Dreamy Pines Motel. That's what it's called, right? Dreamy Pines from memory. Uh, yes. Yeah. It, uh, well, you wouldn't do because he got burned down, didn't it, in the book? Right. But I wonder so. where he had he seen a motel. <laughs> well, Matthew with the spoilers yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, and there is actually I mean, say, 007 in the Adirondacks on Twitter. I mean, she lives there, so I, I, you know, I know, and she did recreated the journey on the moped actually from Montreal to to Lake George. So I, I need to to sit with her. Maybe she can show me some sites around there that maybe there is a motel that he he uh, based it on that he saw. It could have been, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it it kind of always fascinates me whether or not he actually either read the novel Psycho or saw the Hitchcock yeah. film Psycho for him to. Because it seems to be, you know, quite a bit of sort of, you know, sort of similarity between the two, you know, Definitely. especially the motel setting. Are you on the hunt for your next thrilling spy read? Look no further. Spybury contributor and Sunday Times chief political commentator Tim Shipman has curated a list of his top 125 spy authors ranked. With Tim's vast experience and expertise in politics and spy thrillers, you can trust his judgment on the best spy authors of all time. This list includes both classic and modern writers, making it the ultimate guide for any spy fan. But wait, there's more. Tim also recommends which book to try first from each author, and he shares his favorite book from each of them too, so you can dive right into the best of the best. Ready to get your hands on Tim's list? Head over to spybury.com forward slash top125 to grab your free copy now. Don't miss out on the ultimate spy reading list. Visit spybury.com forward slash top125 today. All right, let's go to your third pick. What's the, your third choice? Uh, well, my third pick is a quite a recent one, and it is Anthony Horowitz mm. with a mind to kill. Um, well, this is... Uh, my favourite of the Horowitz's novels. Right. Um, and, I mean, I read this last year on holiday, and it was that good that even the wife read it as well. Um, but when I read it, I honestly thought it just comes straight out of the bottom drawer of, of Ian Fleming. Wow. You know, 
I, I, I literally thought Fleming had written it. And what I, I what I kind of find really clever about it is that you've got You Only Live Twice, which ends with uh, Bond uh, falling from a balloon and suffering with amnesia and London presuming he's dead. Um, and then he then returns in the man with the golden gun, brainwashed, uh, making an attempt on M's life, which why on earth they never done that in the Daniel Craig films, I don't know, because I think Daniel Craig would have really pulled that off. Mm. Um, and then, you know, M kind of gets him sort of sort to, you know, get him back on the straight and narrow, and then he sends him after Scaramanga. And I'd actually read that book not long ago, and I do actually find it very underrated because I really enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, there's some great lines in there. And I kind of read the book and I kind of really enjoyed it and never thought much of it. But then Horowitz has kind of come along and he's kind of um, sort of created kind of threads with loose ends and then it's tied them up. So it's kind of expanded off the events of The Man with the Golden Gun, which I never even thought about doing. And, you know, obviously he's got Colonel Boris and uh, I don't want to say Jimi Hendrix, but it's not Henry. It's just a character called Hendrix yeah. um, comes in. And I think it's just fantastic how Horowitz has just sort of expanded on what Fleming had kind of written and, you know, sort of created his own kind of story from it, really. Um, but, yeah, I mean, again, spoiler alert, uh, the ending is kind of left open to right. interpretation, um, but I, I, yeah, it's I, I, I just really, really enjoyed it. And I'm actually sort of sad to see horror it's go because I think it did a fantastic job. Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, Forever in a Day, he, you know, that was set before Casino Royale, and that was, you know, about the previous 007. Um, and then he did Trigger Mortis, which. I do need to give another try, to be honest. Um, and then he did with a mind to kill. Um, but with horror, it's, I mean, what's made him a little bit different is he's actually sort of um, done something really unique because in the first two of his novels, he's obviously incorporated unpublished material. Um, with a mind to kill, I mean, I've got the Waterstones edition, which has got bonus content, and that's just got like a little bit... Uh, like sort of a script that Fleming had jotted out for um, an unproduced James Bond television series. Um, but he's never incorporated that into the story like he did with the other two. Um, so, yeah, I mean, with The Mind to Kill, um, I would recommend reading The Man with the Golden Gun first. Yes. And then uh, finishing it off with that. But, yeah, I mean, that that's just... I just really, really enjoyed it. And I think Horowitz was... And it was just an absolute genius. Um, but, I mean, you know, a lot of fans have kind of wanted for a long time for that Bond to sort of make an attempt on M's life, you know, in a movie, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel that if they are going to do that for a future Bond film, then they need Bond to make an attempt on M's life in the pre-title sequence, followed by Paul Ritz's story well the, the broccolis and wilson the, the broccolis and wilson's are keen <laughs> listeners to spy brief so i'm sure they are writing this oh, down well. <laughs> as, um as they listen to this um and yeah. in terms of because i i actually have the book and i haven't read it because we're work i've read the other two uh but we're working our way through the fleming and i kind of wanted to keep them all all separate but i have it next door and you know you say that you probably read man with a golden gun first but then would you advise people like if they've never read any 007 that they don't do that, but they do work their way through the Fleming books and then get to Man with Golden Gun, would that would that be a better way to read these books? Or do you think, no, Man with Golden Gun, then with a mind to a kill is fine? Uh, question. Um, I think definitely the Man with the Golden Gun and with a mind to a kill have got to be read as a pair. Right. Um, because there's returning characters and I think you kind of probably find that you probably enjoy with a mind to kill more if you've read yes. the man with the golden because you know what's happening and there's a lot of like references 
to the man with the golden gun. Yeah. Um, but for somebody who's just starting out, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say make with a mind to kill their first novel. Got it. I think they've got it, you know, because there's going to be like a, a, a lot in there where they're going to be scratching their head thinking, well, what's, you know, what's going off? When did this happen? That's... So it is important for you to read The Man with the Golden Gun first, yeah. I think. That's really good to hear. And and this is why we do the spybury thing, because I, I always remember being in Hatchard's Piccadilly, and I think someone was looking, I think it was Len Dayton Books, and they were looking at London Match. And I said to them cheekily, I said, oh, have you read the two before that one? They were like, there's two before this one? I'm like, yeah, don't make the mistake yeah. of, you know. Uh, and that's why we do what we do, to help people to navigate. Because when you're in a bookstore and you see all these books, and I presume this is what will happen now with with the, the new Fleming books that the new the new versions that are coming out. They'll be back in the stores again with the, the new publication. And you know, it, it, what's it's helpful to navigate to help people navigate their way through it. Yes, um, I mean with them. I mean, I, I, I can remember last year when IFP announced um, that there's going to become the in-house pub- publisher. And one of the things they said was that they wanted to reach out to new audiences. And it certainly kind of made me wonder, you know, would would 15-year-olds be willing to read Fleming? Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's a strange I mean, I don't think it'll ever be on the national curriculum like Shakespeare or John Steinbeck, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it's just an, it's like when they say they're going to appeal to new audiences. I thought, well who are these new audiences? Because I really can't see young generation sort of reading them. I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's sort of a strange one, really. It's well, kind of almost as if the Flemings were probably too old for them to even get into. Yeah. If, you know, yeah. if you know what I mean. Um, Got it. I, don't, I mean, maybe some of the Benson continuation novels might be plausible for them. I don't know. Or even the Charlie Higgs and uh, Young Bond ones might be, but, I don't know. I, I I just don't know if if Fleming would actually get a new audience. Yeah. If you know what I mean? It's, be interesting to it's see. A bit of a, It'll be interesting. I to mean, see. I, I suppose it's like Len Dayton. I mean, the Len Dayton or John Le Carre. You know, do they have they ever sort of introduced a you know a new audience? Yeah, it's interesting there because I think definitely with Le Carre. So when Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy came out in 2011 with Gary Oldman, mm. it's, it's got it's it's an interesting one because there's a lot of folks out there that. I like the TV series with Alec Guinness. Nothing's going to touch it. Well, of course not, yeah. because that was a TV series. They had more time to breathe. I actually think they did a good job on the movie. But my the thing I always say is that renewed my interest in Lakari because I'd struggled with Lakari before. And I remember watching mm. that movie on a flight and thinking, hang on a minute, I don't really get what's happened here. So I went and got the novel and read the novel. And I was like, wow, this guy can really write. And I was ready for it again. So I always think these things, they can be catalysts to to a new audience and i'm hoping with the the charlie higson book maybe people will get it gifted to them because you know it's relevant to to what's happening in the uk well, now possibly, and yeah. go, this is actually good stuff let, let me mm. go back to the source material there's always a hope um what would your third pick i uh, sorry beg your pardon your fourth pick be fourth pick well it, it, it gets even more interesting and i'm yeah. probably going to get slated for this oh we like that come on give it to us but it, am i embarrassed i don't know it is john gardner's for special services. Mm. Um, so again, it, it it's been a long time since I've read it, but with John Gardner is I kind of feel. I mean, I totally get that in Fleming publications, uh, mainly focusing on the works of Fleming. I get that, but I kind of feel that the likes of Gardner and Kinsley Amis, and you know, even Raymond Benson, are sort of getting sort of pushed aside. And mm. um, I mean, there's it'd be great if they actually reissued those titles and those novels. And with John Gardner, I mean, his novels are very hit and miss, but he's got some fantastic titles. I mean, all of his titles are really, really strong. Yeah. And for special services does actually have a Fleming connection um, because uh, just after the war, uh, there's a chap called William Donovan, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and to put it, well, to cut the story short, he was both him and Fleming had basically created the CIA between them. And William Donovan had gifted Fleming a gun with the special services inscribed in it just to say thank you. So 
if Fleming was probably alive a little bit longer, he may well have, you know, wrote a book called for special services. But the fact that John Gardner um, had used it, and I actually love the title as well, and it's obviously got a Fleming connection. But, I mean, the story of the book, yeah, I mean, Gardner's, I suppose, I kind of find that maybe some of the Gardner stories are probably even more dated than some of the Flemings. Um, I mean, with special services, uh, it's basically, um, we see the introduction of Spectre. So this is the first novel, well, John Gardner's second novel, but the first novel of sort of Gardner's Spectre trilogy, if you like. So, you know, you only live twice, we thought that was the end of Blofeld, which it is, but we then learn that Spectre is, is, is revived by Blofeld's daughter, mm. uh, Nina. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, and, and I think the story from memory is that um, Spectre are uh, sticking sort of like narcotics in ice cream to sort of drug the US forces whilst they take control of uh, their satellite system right uh, which is space wolf um which is the equivalent to richard nixon's star wars defense system at the time so it is kind of you know obviously a product of its time again when was and it, it written, does Matthew? sort of do you remember when it was written uh, 1982 yeah so i think it was uh, I, I think nixon was in power reagan. then yeah, I don't reagan. Know. reagan 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 yeah um so yeah, but yeah, it, it's. I mean, also we've got the introduction of Felix Leiter's daughter as well, mm. um, Cedar, which happens to become the Bond girl of the story, which is a little bit sort of dodgy because how would Felix respond to the fact that uh, you know his best mate uh, copped off with his daughter? Oh wow! Um, yeah, yeah so jarring. it's yeah it, in the sort of Roger Moore terms, it's certainly. Uh, eyebrow raising um but uh but yeah i mean i i think i just find it quite interesting because the literature bond seems to experiment more with specter and blofeld than what eon have ever done yeah um i mean there's i don't know if it's been released yet or or it should be due to be released that dynamite comics uh releasing a, a book called agent of specter and it's basically where bond um, teams up with Blofeld and becomes a, a Spectre agent to join forces to th- and between them to thwart an even bigger a bigger enemy. Wow. So, kind of, and I, I kind of think things like that are pretty cool, you know, mm. because there's so much you could do with Spectre. And uh, but yeah, I mean, for special services, I just like because uh, Gardner has expanded on, you know the characters that Fleming have written by introducing us to Felix's daughter, Cedar, and basically to sort of revive Spectre yeah. and to, you know, give us a daughter of Blofeld, which we didn't even know anything about. Um, but yeah, I mean, with the John Gardner ones, it's some, some stories are good, some aren't so good, but the majority of his stories do contain a lot of double and triple crossing, and right. it always seems to be in the height of Cold War. So the KGB and the Soviets, communism, it's kind of heavily me- me- you know, mentioned throughout his sort of period. Um, but yeah, I-, I-, I think the special services would be the fourth pick, um, purely because I-, I just find it kind of an interesting entry, yeah. really. So I've never read any of the Gardner 007s. I've read some of his other work. Is the special services the one you'd say, yeah, try that one first? No. Okay. (laughs) Which one would would be the one to start with? I I would probably go with Icebreaker, which Mm. is his third one. Um, I mean, the, the thing with, I mean, what I do like about John Gardner is that he's made Bond timeless because he never actually mentions Bond's age or Bond's year of birth. I mean, when John Gardner first got the gig uh, or whilst promoting License Renewed back in 1981, uh, in an interview, he kind of said that it basically treated the character of Bond as if he uh, was put to sleep in the 60s and frozen and then woke him up and thawed him out Mm. in the 80s. So 
Bond himself hasn't changed, apart from he's got a big grey around the temples, but the world around him has. Um, and I kind of think that works, because when you get to the Raymond Benson novels, I, I think Benson uh, kind of mentions Bond's year of birth as being 1952, which was obviously the same as Piers Brosnan's. Mm. And I kind of think, well, that's not actually Fleming's Bond, because yeah. Fleming's Bond was born in the 1920s. And, you know, obviously you can't, you know, mention that in a contemporary book because you're going to make Bond like 100 years old. But with John Gardner never mentioning Bond's age or year of birth, I think kind of works pretty well mm-hmm. because it does give it that sort of flawless kind of continuation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Icebreaker is a really strong one. And I kind of really like Cold as well, mm-hmm. which was his final one, um, because that was written in 96. Um, he did the novelization for Goldeneye, which obviously had a female M. So with Cold, he cleverly split the story in two parts where we saw Sir Miles Mezabay resigning and then he saw the um, transition to the new female M, which kind of then obviously made it relevant to the film and then kind of tied it in with his Goldeneye novelization. And then when Raymond Benson came along, um, he was the one that gave Judy Dench's M a name of right. Barbara Maudsley. Um so yeah, I, I, I think yeah. Uh, so yeah, definitely Icebreaker um, is a good one. It's funny you mentioned that one because I remember as a kid. Did that come out like mid eighties? Which one, Icebreaker? Icebreaker, yeah. Uh, Nineteen eighty-three. Yeah, because uh, uh, tallies. Because I remember seeing it. Uh, so I would have been eight or nine. I remember seeing it in the shop and saying to my uh, old man, I was like, "Oh, there's a new Bond movie coming out called Icebreaker." Because I'd seen the book. So I just automatically yeah. assumed, oh, there's a new, you know, there's no internet there. There's no whatever. I'm not connected. Whatever. Like, but that's stuck in my head, Icebreaker. So I'm definitely going to go and, and order that one. What would you say are some of the starkest differences in the writing style of, say, Fleming versus Horowitz uh, versus Gardner? Is, is there anything that, that comes to mind? Um, I think Horowitz... It's probably similar. I mean, as I said, with The Mind to Kill, I actually thought that that was a Fleming mm-hmm. book. Um, I don't... I mean, John... I mean, Fleming is always known for his detail, um, you know, sort of his attention to detail. And, you know, obviously, he had a huge passion for golf. So in Goldfinger, you had a chapter, uh, you know, dedicated to golf. Um, I, I, in, in terms of... Uh, you know, sort of getting absolute detail and describing it, I don't think you can really top Fleming. Yeah. Um, I think Fleming was a master of that. Um, but with, I, I don't, I mean, I, first, it, it's been a long time since since I have read these. Um, but there is something which does tell you that you can tell that it's not Fleming. Yeah. So do they, for instance, um, so so when I read Fleming, what I particularly enjoy thinking is like, okay, if I was around in the, you know, when these came out, you know, he, he's a great travel writer. He describes locations and settings and, and food really well. And these would have been locations and destinations and food that chances are in the 50s I would never have got to experience. And that's what I like about the Fleming writing. You know, he brings that glamour into people's, I mean, <laughs> think about it. You know, you can get, well, one one pound Ryanair flights across Europe these days, you know. Well, in Fleming's yeah. era, no one, you're lucky to go to North Wales camping for most of us. Well, that absolutely. I mean, Casino Royale. I mean, that was set in the in in France, and you know, now France wouldn't even be considered as as being exotic. Yeah. But back then it was because they was written at the you know I mean Britain was still sort of recovering from the war, and you know traveling abroad and then and, and exotic travel just wasn't a thing. So you know, and I, I and I think that's why Fleming was very 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 popular because he kind of just injected that bit of vibrancy yeah. by taking the reader to places like Japan, Jamaica, you know. Mud um, baths you know, in France. Sarasota. Mud yes, baths. Yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> America, all around there. Um, when the 1980s came along, you know, the world had changed, you know, drastically yeah. to the 50s and 60s. Um, and I suppose travel, you know, going abroad was more of a thing. So, 
maybe the exoticness of John Gardner's novels wasn't quite there yeah. as it would have been with the Fleming ones. That's why I love Thrilling Cities. Thrilling Cities is one of my favourite books. Just love reading. Um, I've got the Diamond Smugglers, but I still need to get the Thrilling Cities yeah. and I still need to read that. It's, 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 it's like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I still need to read yeah. them as well. <laughs> it's fun because what what I tend to do is I get Thrilling Cities and let's say there's a chapter on Honolulu in Hawaii and I remember going there for work. I'll re- I always read the chapter beforehand and it's so funny to kind of look at Fleming's view of Honolulu or Berlin or Chicago versus what it is today. Mm. So it acts as a time yeah. capsule and it was oh, very I've funny. Absolutely. This This will make you laugh. Uh, so the Honolulu one, he actually, Fleming goes back to, he walks along the beach at Waikiki and he goes back to his room because he's like, this is like, you know, the way he writes about it, it's almost like Bournemouth. You know, it's full of old OAPs along the beach and there's not much to look at. And I had just taken a walk along the same Waikiki. And I tell you what, I definitely needed a cold shower, put it that way, because the sights you see on Waikiki Beach today, Fleming would have loved it. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's, yeah. <laughs> I'll get in trouble for saying that, but hey, it's dead <laughs> drop five. Um, so so uh, plenty of money riders then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's funny to get his his perception and of a place and then go visit all these years later. Um, what would be your fifth pick? Uh, my fifth pick would be um, by Royal Command by Charlie Ixon. Mm. Uh, so this, um, I mean, I don't know if it's ever been discussed much on Spybury, but no. Charlie Ixon basically did a series of young Bond, Bond stories, uh, which saw... Fleming's Bond uh, in his teenage years during the 1930s at Eton College. Um, and by Royal Command was his fifth and final young Bond story. And it kind of, and I really enjoyed it. And it kind of marries in with what Fleming had wrote in Bond's obituary at the end of You Only Live Twice. Uh, because in the obituary, it mentions that Bond was basically kicked out of Eton due to an incident with a maid. Um, that incident is has been uncovered. Right. Um, and that incident isn't quite as sordy as we would all thought. It's totally different, totally innocent. Um, but uh, but, but at, at, at the end of the day, these were aimed at teenage, yeah. you know, teenagers, so it had to be. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's basically... Uh, I mean, the thing with Hickson is I would definitely recommend it because... It's it's just sort of a different time period for Bond, and we're seeing Bond as a teenager, which we have never seen before. You know. Um, so and, does he work for the intelligence services in in his teenage years? How does that? Uh, I've never well, read not, any, to be his, honest. No. Well, his uncle uh, was a spy, um, and by royal command, I think it's basically sort of suggested that the intelligence has been keeping an eye on him. Right. Um, and they basically do recruit him. Um, and then, but with, so Charlie Hickson had done, done five uh, young bonds. And then Steve Cole came later on and, and, and did four and then um, sort of did his years at FETS in Edinburgh. Now, I mean, no disrespect to Steve Cole, but his books are okay, but they're just not quite yeah. as good as Charlie Hickson's. And, that kind of sort of thought, hang on, you know, you could probably get it like a series of authors who would then write about Bond's time in the Navy and during World War Two, and evidently leading up to uh, Forever and a Day. Yeah. You know, so you, you could have a great, so there's kind of like almost a great big gap of Bond's life, which hasn't been written about. Um I mean, whether or not Ian Fleming publications are going to ever go down that route, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, with with Charlie Hickson's uh, five young Bond novels, they are very good, and they kind of also interestingly sort of mirror the first five Fleming novels mm. as well. Um, I mean, Silverfin was his first, and uh, even the opening line of Silverfin is very, very, very similar to the opening line of Casino Royale. Um, and then you've got Blood Fever, which is set in the Caribbean and deals with pirates. Um, live and let die set in the Caribbean and involves um, pirates and uh, gold coins 
Uh, Igson's third, uh, Double the Die, is set in London and in the United Kingdom. So is Moonraker. Uh, Hurricane Gold, um, there's the girl in there called Precious Stone. Well, Precious Stone is diamonds. Diamonds are mm. forever. And by royal command is very similar to From Russia With Love because the Russians are involved. Um, and it's kind of as if, you know, it, it's basically a, a game of cat and mouse again for Bond, you know, very similar to what From Russia With Love is. So Higson cleverly kind of mirrors his first five Bond novels on mm. Fleming's first five Bond novels. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, back in 2004, 2005, when they announced it, I was very sort of a little bit sort of suspicious because yes. I thought these are going to be very, very much like Harry Potter books. And, and I hadn't just... There, hadn't, I, it, hadn't there been a cartoon, James Bond Jr.? Oh, yeah. I mean, back in the not 90s, early right? 90s. Oh no, no, uh, no! And um, it's no, uh, yeah, ja- yeah, that's totally something else. Um, okay, yeah, James Bond Jr. No, that that was uh, basically James Bond's nephew. Okay, yeah, uh, which we didn't even know Bond had a brother, to be honest. But <laughs> yeah, James, yeah, that was. Uh, I mean, funny enough, I mean, at, at the time in the early nineties. Uh, that was way before I actually got introduced to Bond. So even though it was on the telly, I I, yeah. I never watched it because yeah. it was just totally off my radar. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of their, I mean, the episodes are available on YouTube. Mm. Um, if you want to laugh, it's definitely worth watching. Right. Um, very bizarre concept. I'm very sure. strange. But yes, you've got Michael Wilson to uh, to thank for that. Right. Um, the- the other, but, se- yeah, no. the other series that's often referenced a lot in Spybury, so the Higgs and Young Bonds do get a lot of uh, compliments in our Spybury community. The other series that I've never read, and I'd love to your, your take on this, is is the Money Penny Diaries. Have you read those? Oh, wow. Um, funny enough, I have only uh, just sort of started rediscovering them, uh, and I've read the first two. Um, I've still got the third one to read. Um but yeah, I mean, they, 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 I mean, they were actually sort of, kind of came out at the same time as the uh, Higgs and Young Bonds, and yeah, I mean, I mean, they really are worth worth reading. Yeah. I mean, they are just uh, it, it's. I mean, the only gripe I have with them is that it kind of flitters between uh, the sixties to present time because they're told from the perspective of Miss Money Penny's uh, niece, right. but what the author uh, Samantha Weinberg has done is she's kind of latched on to that tongue in cheek joke, which Fleming had written in the obituary at the end of year and live twice, where um, I think it was that Bond was actually a proper person and that the uh, SIS or secret service had employed Fleming, the journalist to write a series of fictitious books about James Bond to try and throw the Russians off. So, these so, so what she's done is she's written them as if Money Penny was an actual real person, right? Um, sort of very similar to the John Pearson biography of James Bond, yeah. which I don't know if you've read that, yes. but that's a very strange concept. Mm. Um, but the beauty is, is that you you're not constantly reminded of that aspect. You can still read it and just and it it, it, it just somehow flows within the adventures that Fleming had written. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, but yeah, I mean, they are definitely worth reading. And <laughs> kind of what really sort of annoyed me is that the last or the year before, when they was publicising um, the new Kim Sherwood series, Double or Nothing, that, you know, the media was, you know, saying, oh, yeah, you know, Kim Sherwood, she's the first female to write for Bond. It's like, well, hang on. What about Samantha Weinberg? And I think um, some of the spy bearings were just saying that at the time, the Money Penny Dead Diaries weren't successful, uh, which is probably why they've never got republished. Um, but it's kind of like as if IFP was sort of slightly embarrassed by him and sort of trying to brush him mm-hmm. under the carpet. But overall, I do find them a lot more sort of superior, you know, better written and solid than, you know, than the Kim Sherwood take you know um, so yeah the money penny diaries is really really worth okay. worth giving a go i'll check that out 
Right. So thank you for the five picks. I've only read two of those, so I've got some homework to do here. So thank you for that, Professor okay. Grice. <laughs> now, I, we send you behind the Iron Curtain, where there's a couple of extra items that you're, you're allowed to take with you. So what luxury item would you request? What would you take with you behind enemy lines? Ooh, luxury. Uh, I don't know. The, some beer. Beer? Would, okay. Would, would, would that do? I don't know. Well, I get to ask you. you it's your luxury <laughs> item, so you, you can take beer. I, 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 I can't think. Yeah, it's, why not beer? I mean, okay. you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to live or die, so, um, you know. Oh, they do have good I mean, beer in East Berlin. I mean, you know, oh, well, that, they didn't have a lot of stuff, yeah. but the beer is pretty good in Germany. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, but it's your luxury so yeah, item, yeah, yeah, so... I, I, I think from the top of me, I, I'm just going to say just, just some good good quality real ale. There you go. Uh, stout, preferably, or, or good mild. I do like a mild. Now, if we can give you a phone number for any spy, fictional or in real life, to come help you escape if you're in trouble, other than James Bond. James yeah. Bond's not available. He's on a mission somewhere. Oh. So who are you going to call? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm putting to say Harry Palmer. Yeah. Yeah, he knows his Would name on okay? Berlin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Harry Palmer. Um, purely because he's just got a really cool accent. Yeah. You know. I think that Cockney accent will probably just make you at ease. Yeah. You know. Um, but yeah, I think Harry, Harry Palmer. Palmer. Good good choice. You know, I mean What about a piece of music, right? It can be an album, it can be a song. Uh what would you take with you? Uh well, I mean, I, I'm kind of more into my instrumentals than vocals um, i mean I, i'm i'm kind of very old school as well i mean i i, I don't do today's music it, it's, it's just nothing but noise um i'd, I'd probably i don't know I, I'd, I'd probably say give me an album of ang marvin and the shadows excellent choice so we're about to extract you from east berlin You've only got time to grab one of these five picks that you've come up with today. Which one are you grabbing? Uh, it'll have to be Casino Royale. Yeah, yeah. It's a very you know, iconic the, 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 book, isn't it? This, yeah, it, it's iconic. This is where it started. And I would think that, I mean, this is probably where your um, book reviews come in because you know, do you ever sort of always compare them to the first Fleming novel? You know, is Casino Royale what the other subsequent Bond novels are gauged against? Yeah. You know, it, uh, it's... But yeah, I think... I, I think what we want to do is at the end of that, that the Fleming roundup is have, uh, bring all the Spiberians on, let's have a full-on panel discussion about the Fleming works. Because the question I always have in my mind is, how is he developing as a character? And we could go hours on that. And and that's what I like about Fleming's writing. It's not just this one-dimensional action figure. You know, in Casino Royale, he's questioning what's good, what's bad, you know, who's on the right side here, you know. And, and you yeah. see that going throughout the book. Uh, so he might be this blunt instrument employed by the government, but he has real thoughts and feelings. He does. And, and, and what's sort of interesting about, but I mean, I mean, I don't know if it's the same with... Um, uh, uh, George, well, Harry Palmer or George Sampson. I don't know. I mean, do, do, do they, uh, is it George Sampson? Bernard, is that, Bernard uh, Sampson. Bernard yeah. Sampson. I mean, because obviously James Bond was a reflection of Fleming. So, kind of, as Fleming's health was, uh, health was deteriorating, Bond kind of became a little bit darker. So, as a character, yeah, he definitely changed throughout the you know, sort of years and, you know, throughout the 14 books. But I don't know if Bernard Samson, I mean, did that reflect the works of John McCarry or Harry Palmer? Did that reflect Len Dayton? You know, it's... Well, why don't we ask that on the panel discussion? I want to bring a lot of spy barons on. We'll record it. We'll air it. I think that's a really good question, you know, because for me, 
uh, reading these books, I personally noticed the development in his character. And, and I think some of that as well is because with each one, we get a little sneak peek behind the scenes. I think it was it Moonraker uh, from memory where, you know, he's work, he's being made to work in the office and you get to see kind yeah. of the daily routine that you wouldn't necessarily. And, and I think it was Goldfinger. M's got him working the night shift and yeah, not exactly glamorous, yeah. right? So you get no. to see. Um, I mean, Bond absolutely detested paperwork, office yeah. work. He'd rather have been out in the field. Yeah. Um, but I mean, even to see that, in the film would be kind of interesting. Yeah. It it may come across as boring, but for us, you know, sort of Fleming lovers, it, it'd just be great to see Bond behind a desk, it you know, really, doing what Fleming had written. It really would. Well, I've got one final question. For, well, I've got two final questions for you, actually. Um, so first of all, who else, or who would you like to hear next on Dead Drop 5? Um... I would probably uh, go for my good buddy, Mr. Ian Douglas. Ian Douglas, yeah, absolutely. You know, he he would be a good guest. We'll we'll, we'll see if he's he's open to that to get him on. And my final question for you, and this isn't actually related to Dead Drop Five, it's related to the movies. And I saw some wonderful photographs of you at the premiere at Albert Hall for No Time to Die. How was oh. that? What was that like for you? Uh, that was absolutely incredible. It was just, it, 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 I think what made it even more amazing is because it was obviously with COVID and stuff, that film, it was the first film to be delayed, you know, the first major blockbuster to be delayed. And they kept postponing, they kept changing the time, you know, the dates and stuff. And it was just one of these things, you know, are we ever going to see this film? And then that film came out and it was just absolutely incredible. I mean, I absolutely love that film. I know it's a very controversial film, but I love it because it had everything that I was expecting, you know, that I was wanting in it. I was kind of, if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, I was kind of hoping that Daniel Craig's Bond would die because, you know, again, it's something that they've never done before and Daniel Craig can pull that off. But I mean more like, how was the experience of being at a premiere? Because for the vast Uh, majority of us, we've never been. He, he, he exp- yeah, it was just incredible. It was just absolutely very surreal. You know, it, I mean, you were sort of on the red carpet. You literally had Daniel Craig, all these big stars kind of walking past you. The atmosphere was, I mean, there's about 5,000 people there. But when you're actually inside the Albert Hall, you've got, you know, his royal, well, now King Charles and Queen Camilla, they were there, Prince William. You had the stars all down the stage. And it, it, it was just such a fantastic feeling to think, hang on, I'm the very first person in the world to see this film. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I think, I mean, because I was invited and I, I, was, I was actually very sort of hesitant in going, thinking, well, can I afford it? You know, and the wife, bless her, she says, look, it's a once in a lifetime you know, chance. Yes. It's Daniel Craig's last film. Yes. Just go. So I did. Um, and I think, I mean, when Bond 26 comes out, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd go to the premiere there because, I, well, I don't know. But the fact that Daniel Craig was a very well established actor by that time and it made his mark on the Bond mm-hmm. series, uh, personally, he is, you know, if not the favourite of mine. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's just the old sort of fact that it was his last film and that it was a film that we kind of have been waiting so long oh, for oh, yeah, and the fact that we were there um but yeah i mean i mean bond it's i think probably that and star wars and maybe some of the marvel films i think they're probably the only sort of massive film events you know um but yeah it's just absolutely incredible experience Excellent. It really well, was. I was very envious looking at the pictures, but I was also really pleased because knowing how much Bond's been a part of your life, and we haven't even, we'll have to bring you back on to talk about your collection, which I, I always enjoy what you share uh, well, yes, online. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that you were there because you know you you are a a real Bond fan. Um, do you have a blog? Do you have an online presence? Is there anywhere people can follow you, Matthew? Um, I don't have a blog. Um, I am an admin on the Facebook uh, group Hildebrand, uh, James Bond, and I run that um, with eight other admins. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, checked out at Hildebrand. I mean, uh, I kind of also run that alongside Ian Douglas as well. Um, and what I, I, I'm kind of proud of saying is that we kind of like to make that group that little bit more different and a bit more refined than other James Bond groups. You know, um, I mean, first of all, we will only, I mean, if there's any clickbait articles or stuff from the sun, forget it because that's just total nonsense. We will try and uh, sort of give and post the most official and, you know, noteworthy stuff there is. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, I'm also on Instagram as well uh, under Shathand Grice, um, and that's just basically the portfolio for my love of Bond and my collection. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I am, you know, just on Facebook, and I am yeah. just um, one of the eight admins on Hildebrand. Well, James I, Bond will, group. I will add a link to Hildebrand and to your Instagram in our show notes, which uh, listeners can find at spybury.com forward slash 209. I officially endorse the Hildebrand Group. It's my favorite James Bond online community. I, I lurk more than I post, uh, but I, I read most of the, the threads and I really enjoy the discussions on there. I mean, you guys are on a whole different level to me. I thought I was a pretty hardcore Bond fan until I came across you lot. I'm like, yeah, I'm just a wannabe. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it, it's it's very nice for you to say I'm, you know, very knowledgeable, but there is a lot of other people out there which are probably more, well, are, no doubt more knowledgeable than me you know i mean yeah i have got my own bond room i've got a wife that's very tolerable um i have a good collection but there is people out there that have got even bigger collections yeah. and i absolutely just worship the ground they walk on Marvelous. you know it's just absolute yeah. legendary um but i mean you know i'm not massively into football i've never been into sport and you know james bond that's my hobby yeah you know I'm happy to watch, read, talk about it, collect it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, but Marvelous. yeah, it's it, it it's been an absolute pleasure uh, being on Spybury. Um, I am, as you said, a, a regular listener. Um, obviously, with the James Bond connections and the James Bond episodes with the Book Club review, I absolutely love love listening to them. And the fact that you're reviewing them in the time that it was written kind of makes it even more interesting. It's a lot of fun. It's it's a lot of fun um, to do it that way, uh, but also quite scary because sometimes you you want to talk about something that happened in advance, and and we yeah, do it I mean, for the the politics, but also because we don't want to talk about the movies as well. We want it purely to be no. like novels. So recording your publication, yes. means we don't get into those discussions as well. So. Yes, which obviously, I mean, I think are you up to Goldfinger? Yeah, now, we just finished Goldfinger, you... so we've got the short stories next. Yeah, so when you do. So I, I should think it's very difficult because you can't even mention the movies because yeah. the movies, of course, wasn't made. So I think it would be when you get to The Spy Who Loved Me, I think that came out when Dr. No first came out. Right, yeah. 1962. So you might be able to just, you know, start releasing that vow because it, it must be really, really hard not to compare it to the film. It is, but it's a because really good it, exercise. It's because you're purely thinking about the novel, you know? yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, listen, thank you very much. I want to be respectful of your time. It's been an absolute blast to catch up with you. I knew this would be a good one. I knew we'd get nuggets out of you on, on your five picks. Um so so thank you for coming on to Spinebury. And as I say, thank the show you for notes, having me, Shane. Uh, absolute pleasure. Absolute and we'll absolute have you on pleasure. again. Maybe absolute. we need to look at getting you on for the book club edition to see if you can chat about these without referencing the movies. So uh, Oh possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Take take a look at the ones that are next, and if you fancy a reread, then then uh, drop us a note so uh, we'll feature you on a future yes. one. But definitely on the panel yes. when we finish the the Flemings, we'll, we'll definitely do a panel, and we'd love love to have you involved oh. with that one. Oh wow, thank you, I'd mostly appreciated. That's it. That's yes. Library episode two hundred and nine. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Spybrary Podcast. You don't have to wait for the next episode. Join the conversation happening now at facebook.com slash spybrary and on Twitter at spybrary.